in order to talk about what bootstrapping is, we need to talk about two things that kind of go into making up bootstrapping and why anyone would use it. We need to talk about a sample and a confidence interval. Because what bootstrapping basically does is take your sample and build you a nice confidence interval. If you don't understand what that means yet, don't worry, because we're going to talk about what is a sample and what is a confidence interval. Uh, okay, what is a sample? Here is the community of people that you are interested in talking about. So let's just say this is our, this is our city, our community, and we would like to be able to say what they think about a particular issue. Most often, you don't have the time or the money or the capacity to ask every single one of these people in your community what their opinion is. Um, sometimes you have the time and money, but not the capacity. Sometimes you have the capacity, but not the time. Uh, there's many combinations, but usually it's very hard uh, to get an effective population-wide uh, survey of people. So instead, you're going to take a survey Instead of talking to every person, you're going to take a survey. And you're going to take a survey from a smaller group of people than your entire population. And the smaller group of people, like a little subsection of your population, that's called your sample. So here's my population. Yeah, here's my whole population, all of these people. And then this yellow line here shows this is my sample. Community sample. What you want is to understand the feelings of your community, not your sample. But you can't afford to ask every single person in your community what they think and feel. So instead, you ask the people in your sample what they think and feel, and then you take the, the data that you've collected from your sample and you do a couple of things to it to make it represent the thoughts and feelings of your community. So how you collect your sample uh, determines the different kind of statistical things that you need to do to your sample to be able to talk uh, confidently, accurately about your community. Uh, we're not, today we're not gonna go into all the different ways to collect a sample. Um, we will on another day. But today, we're just going to say, um, if you've done something that's very fancy, um, the scientific term, random sampling, which means that everybody in your population essentially got their names thrown into a hat, and the number of people that you sampled were drawn r randomly out of the hat. You shook up the hat and everybody had the very same probability of getting their name pulled out of the hat as everybody else. If you've done that, then you can basically assume that the feelings of your sample will be pretty much representative of the feelings of your community. This is a big issue and there's a lot of nuance. Um, and we'll talk about it at greater length at another time. And if you're actually going to be drawing a sample, um, we should do some more reading and I can give you lots of recommendations of, of videos to watch and what to read. But essentially for the purpose of understanding what bootstrapping is, you just need to know that a sample is a small subset of your community who provided you with answers to your survey or answers to your research. Okay. Second part of understanding bootstrap is what is a confidence interval? A confidence interval, the definition is it's a range of values that we are fairly sure contains our true value. So let's pretend from the survey, the picture above, that we asked um, a sample of people uh, what their um, what their sense of belonging was on a scale of one to five, uh, how, what is their sense of belonging? So one, if they give us a one, that means that they're um, not uh, feeling very connected to their community. And if they're giving us a five, 
that means that they have a very strong sense of belonging. Let's pretend that our sample on average, when we averaged it all together, so we're taking the micro data and we're aggregating it into an average. Let's pretend that they said it was a 4.1. So on a scale of uh, one to five, our people said, our sample said 4.1. So the question that our confidence interval is trying to ask is, how confident are we in that number being representative of the actual community? So we know this 4.1 is the sense of belonging for our sample. We wanna know whether we're, um, <laughs> very, <laughs> very unconfident that 4.1 represents um, the population or we're very confident that the 4.1, I'm gonna write this to over here, why not? Okay, so that 4.1 is from the sample and what we wanna do is talk about the community. So how confident are we that this 4.1 from the sample represents the true feelings and experiences of our entire community? Are we very unconfident? We think it doesn't represent it at all. Or are we very confident? We think, yes, um, we're very sure that that 4.1 uh, represents the actual feelings of the community. So the confidence interval is one of the ways that researchers and statisticians try and say, this is how confident we are. And usually what you hear is um, we're 95% we're confident, right? Um, we're 95% confident or we're 90% confident that, um, that this range of answers is true. So a confidence interval is a range. So for example, a 95% confidence interval might be that we are 95% sure that based on the sample of 4.1, we are 95% sure that the community has a sense of belonging rating between say 3.5 and 4.6. And this right here, is our confidence interval. So this is us saying, we are confident that the community's sense of belonging is somewhere between 3.5 and 4.6. And what we're not gonna go into right now is the technical, traditional way of calculating that confidence interval. All you need to know is that there's a formula that's used for calculating that confidence interval. And that formula is based on a couple of things. The number of observations in your sample. So um, that's how many people from your population answered your survey. If it was, um, if your population is 100 people and 15 answered your survey, then your sample size is 15. So that makes a difference in how big or small your sample size is. Um, the mean, so that would be the 4.1, so the, the kind of the outcome of your sample, so the outcome of our sample was that um, on average, the average sense of belonging was 4.1. And then the standard deviation of your population. So do not be alarmed by this word. <laughs> this word, standard deviation, just means basically um, how close together the people are in their um, in their feelings of sense of belonging. So in other words, if you're living in a community where most people have basically the same kind of feelings about uh, their sense of belonging, most people are a lot like each other in your community. That means your community will have a small standard deviation. Deviation is a, a fancy word for like um, distance. Um, or difference. So how different 
are the people in your community around this question, around the question that you care about? So if your community, most people feel basically the same about their sense of belonging, your standard deviation is very small. People are a lot like each other. However, if your community is really different, and some people feel like they really belong to your community, some people really feel like they don't belong to your community, and some people in the middle, they kind of feel like they belong to your community, then your standard deviation is gonna be really big because people are really different in your community. So this is really important in trying to figure out the confidence interval um, because, because um, how similar or different people are in your population make a big difference in um, how good of a job your sample is going to do in telling you anything about your community. But here comes the rub, <laughs> okay? It is the standard deviation of your population. So the fancy formula in math for calculating your confidence interval is based on the standard deviation of your population. So we need to know how similar or different people in our community are in their feelings of sense of belonging. Now, of course, if you think about this for very long, it's going to become obvious to you that this is a problem because the whole point of this research is that we don't know what uh, my community thinks and feels about their sense of belonging. We don't have that data from everybody in our community. If we had that data from everybody in our community, then uh, we would not be taking a sample and asking them this question right? So what mathematicians do is they make an assumption about what they think the standard deviation of our population is. They put that into the big fancy math formula and they get a confidence interval. So that's how kind of traditional confidence intervals are created. And this right here is what makes some people uncomfortable because it's based on a very big assumption about what, whether the people in your community are a lot like each other or not a lot like each other without usually really knowing that. <laughs> I mean, there's some situations where you do know that. But there's a lot of situations where you don't. So this guy named Brad Efron in the 1970s figured out a way to create a confidence interval that doesn't rely on that assumption, the assumption of how similar or different the people are in your population. Uh, this new way is called bootstrapping. And bootstrapping is a new way to get a confidence interval without making a lot of assumptions about your population, whether it's similar to each other or different and how those similarities and differences are distributed. Again, this could be a four hour PhD lecture, but this is a summary to get you uh, understanding what the word means, bootstrapping. So essentially, let's pretend that these are the eight people in our sample that we asked for, um, for their sense of belonging. So this is our sample. And each of these people uh, got to give an give a answer on a scale of one to five. This person said one, this person said five, um, this person said two, this person said three, this person said four, <laughs> this person said five, this person said one, and this person said three. So this is our sample. And so what we're going to do is take an average of that. So one plus five plus two plus three plus four plus five plus one plus three equals 24 divided by eight. Okay, so the average in this sample, the average sense of belonging is three. And so we have our sample size, eight people. We have our result from our sample, that's three right here. And what we wanna know is how confident are we? Is that three um, almost certainly a good, a close approximation to what our community thinks? Or is this maybe really far away from our what our community thinks, or maybe we have no idea? So one of the things that Brad Efron, who developed, um, 
bootstrap sampling says we can do is instead of making a big assumption about a population, what we could do in theory is to take a whole bunch of new samples from our population. So it, this is called resampling, which because it's doing something again, you're sampling again. So in, in addition to our first eight people, we would take a second eight people and then we take a third eight people. And in fact, we would keep doing this over and over in our population. We would keep getting new samples, keep drawing new names out of the hat um, until uh, we have maybe a um, hundred different samples. And each of these, of course, would give us a different average. We already know that this average is three. Let's just pretend that when we add these people up and take an average, it's uh, four. And when we throw these people all back into the hat and choose eight new people, say now we get 2.8, we could keep doing this until we had hundreds if not thousands of unique samples. And then we could take all of these results and um, line them up and figure out what what the 95% confidence interval is. So how we would do that, let's see if this is white. Yes, this is not white, okay. How we would do that is each of these samples, so this three, this four, this two, we put in order, we'd make a histogram like this, and we would do the five levels of belonging right here, one, two, three, four, five. And every time we got a three, we would put it in. That's three. And then we got a four. We put that in. That's one. Oh yeah, sorry, no, that's wrong. Sorry, ignore my thing. Okay. <laughs> one unit said three, because this sample up here said three. And then one unit says four, because this unit right here, this sample here says four. One unit says 2.8, because this unit here, this sample here has 2.8. So you do this over and over again until eventually you have a histogram like this that shows you the number of times that each sample gave you an average. So it would look something like this. It wouldn't look perfectly like this. But essentially, let's say you take a thousand samples and um, this, is, this is satisfaction level one, this is satisfaction level three, and this is satisfaction level five. What you can do by resampling your population over and over and over again, is you'll get a histogram like this, you, which are basically just like blocks. Every time you sample, you do a new sample, you put a new block on. Then you can actually just count and say, okay, 95% of the 1,000 samples that we just took of our population are between here and here. So 95% of the samples that we just took are between, um, say, 2.5 and 4. So we can say that we are 95% confident that the real sense of belonging for the community is going to lie between 2.5 and 4. And we, we've come to that number by taking 1,000 samples from the population. Instead of taking one sample from the population and making um, some assumptions about whether the population is really similar or really different from each other, we didn't make that assumption. We just went and took 1,000 samples from the population and found out what the population was actually like. So that is essentially the concept behind bootstrapping. Of course, if you've ever conducted research, this takes us back to the very first problem 
which is you don't have time, money, resources, and skills to take a thousand samples from your community. If you had time to take a thousand samples from your community, you had time to do a lot of other things. So this is where bootstrapping actually comes into play. With bootstrapping, you take the one sample that you have, this sample here, and you pretend that this sample is your population. That is what bootstrapping is. And what you do, no, sorry. What you do is you put all of these people, so we know that this whole average uh, came, came out to three, yeah. So we know the average here is three, right? This is our actual sample that we took. We, could have, we had the time, the money, and the capacity to take this sample of eight people. So instead of repeatedly taking 100 or 1,000 new, new samples from the population, what we're going to do is we're going to take 100 or 1,000 new samples from this original sample. So instead of throwing the whole population back into the hat, we're only throwing these eight people back into the hat, and we're going to get um, – repeated smaller samples. So instead of a sampling of eight, we'll take a sample of four people. And so we'll get one person, two pe persons, um, three persons, four persons, this person, this person, this person, and this person, and that'll be our new sample. And we'll take an average of their sense of belongings and say it'll turn out to be um, 4.2. Then we're gonna throw everybody back in the hat again, and we are going to get another sample of four. So let's say we get this person, this person, this person, and this person. So again, we've thrown everybody back in hats. We got this person again, and we got this person, and we got this person, and we got this person. So take an average of their all of their sense of belongings and see what we get. Maybe we'll get 2.5. So this is called bootstrapping, and it's a way to use your sample to resample over and over and over again, hundreds or thousands of times to, to see what the, to use the actual population of people to see if they're more or less like each other, rather than just making an assumption about whether your population is more or less like each other. And the reason this works, the reason this was developed in the 70s and became really popular in the 80s and 90s um, is because it takes a lot of computing power. Basically, um, to do this by hand, you can see, would take a very, very long time. But there are um, all kinds of computer programs. There are online websites that'll do it for free, the, um, SPSS and R, um, Stata. They all have things that'll create um, what's called a bootstrapped confidence interval for you, um, which is a confidence interval based on um, the actual distribution in your population rather than some assumptions about your distribution of your population. So the, this is why um, people with certain types of research and certain types of populations really like to use this bootstrap method because it gives you a sense of how confident you can be about your results without making a whole bunch of kind of theoretical and often hard to justify assumptions about how similar or different everybody in your population is um, from its others. So it doesn't change the mean. Sometimes people think um, we're gonna throw um, our small um, population, our sample size is too small, and so we're gonna use a bootstrap and um, get a more reliable mean. A bootstrap does not get a more reliable mean. This number here, three, doesn't change. That's the mean. Instead, what all this bootstrapping does is it gets you all of these numbers, which aren't used to change the mean. They're used to create a um, confidence interval around your mean. 
whoops. <laughs> Um, they're used to create a confidence interval around your meat. So that is what bootstrapping is and why the heck anybody would ever use it. It's actually quite a good tool <laughs> that is, does a very useful thing. And so we are very close to the end of the hour. I am going to wait and see. Um, we have a few more minutes. If anybody on the phone or live um, wants to ask a question, you can just type it into um, the comments box and we'll answer it. And okay, I missed a question from the qualitative section. So if the person asking the question is still here, <laughs> I'm going to say it. Um, one more with the example of an intensity rating on a piece of text, isn't that still, still qualitative? in that the intensity rating is subjective and can't be counted. Absolutely, yes. Um, so in terms of when we take a whole bunch of comments or text data and feed them into some kind of an algorithm that does sentiment analysis on them and decides um, how, uh, how intense somebody was feeling, positive or negative, about your new makeup product or your civ civic hall meeting or um, your new policy. It absolutely still is qualitative data because it's subjective. So thank you for asking that question because I think a better way to say it is we have a lot of tools now that allow qualitative data to be used as if it was quantitative. That, that's what I mean to say. So thank you for asking that question. Um, we have a lot of tools and a lot of um, methods now that take qualitative data, which is very subjective and very much defined um, locally and within, con within the context uh, that it's emerging from, and use it like quantitative data, which is you know, a count of um, you know, how many peas are on this pea pod is <laughs> like objective quantitative data. Um, and because of that, um, people are making claims of objectivity and certainty about statistical models and statistical algorithms and research that is actually embedded with quite a lot of subjectivity, which is the whole reason that we all count exists. Um, and so thank you so much for asking that question. That is a very important question. Help me clarify my own thinking actually about it, which is the point of the data salon. Not, not for me to be the expert and sit up here and tell everybody um, what they should do or think, but, but to promote um, us all learning to demystify, democratize, and demonstrate how to use data together. Um, so the next thing I was supposed to do was show you our website and um, tell you how to um, submit your questions for next month. Um, but it looks like our website is having some um, formatting issues this morning, some back-end website CSS issues. So um, since that's getting fixed, uh, I will just tell you that um, you can follow me on um, Twitter at Datasys, D-A-T-A-S-S-I-S-T. I'm trying to get, see if I can get to the last slide. Nope. Um, you can email me, heather at idatasist.com. And you can find our website at weallcount.com, but don't go there right now because <laughs> it's broken. Um, and um, if you look on our Twitter, you can find the links to the upcoming data amnesties in the future months and also the places to submit your questions anonymously if you'd like to ask them by anonymous um, uh, submission and if you'd like to email or twitter them to me that would be great so thank you so much for joining us for our first 2020 data amnesty salon um, this recording will go up on youtube so you can add your thoughts and comments below. Feel free to share it. And most importantly, feel free to submit the other things that you'd like us to talk about because the point of this is to um, do things that work for you. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye.